Davis, any changes in your 1400 weather map? Well, sir, there's an interesting cold mass forming eccentrically over the Arctic Sea. Never mind the genealogy. How will it affect us tomorrow? Welcome to today's show. My name is John. As always, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, there are links to social media in the podcast show notes. You can go as well to ClassicMovieRev.com to read notes, bios, and other random movie thoughts. Today's movie is Command Decision, 1948. This is a good Clark Gable movie that plays on his real-world experience in the U.S. Army Air Corps in World War II. Being a big star and 40 years old, Gable could have had it pretty easy, but he didn't. But you know who chose to stay behind? John Wayne. Instead, Gable flew at least five combat missions over Germany, and it was reported that Hermann Goring offered a large reward of up to $5 million for downing Gable. The movie has a very solid 7.4 rating on imdb.com. On Rotten Tomatoes, this film is liked by 83% of the audiences. New York Times film critic Bosley Carruthers said of the film, quote, It is the performance of Clark Gable in this scene of a soldier's momentary grieving that tests his competence in the leading role. For this is not only the least likely, but it is the most sentimental moment in the film, and the fact that Mr. Gable takes it with dignity and restraint bespeaks his worth. Otherwise, he makes of General Dennis a smart, tough, straight-shooting man, disciplinary yet human, and a right guy to have in command, unquote. I personally love the goal-driven aspects of this movie, so let's get going with a substantial number of returning actors. Actors. Right, and I'm a Shakespearean actor. The main star is Clark Gable as Brigadier General Casey, a man that has a job to get done. Gable was first covered in Band of Angels, 1957. Walter Pidgeon was in the role of Casey's commander, Major General Roland Goodloe Kane. Pidgeon was first covered in the wonderful sci-fi Forbidden Planet, 1956. Van Johnson was cast in the role of Technical Sergeant Emanuel T. Evans, Casey's dog robber. Johnson was first covered in Battleground, 1949, as was John Hodiak, who played Colonel Edwin Rayton Martin. Marshall Thompson, as the drunken captain, George Washington, Bell Pepper Lee, was also first seen in Battleground. Brian Dunleavy, who played Brigadier General Clifton I. Garnett, was first covered in the film noir The Big Combo, 1955. Charles Bickford was in the role of war correspondent Elmer Brockhurst. Bickford was first covered way back in Of Mice and Men, 1939. John McIntyre played weather forecaster Major Belding Davis. McIntyre was first covered in the film noir The Phoenix City Story, 1955. Holmes Herbert had an uncredited role as the chairman of the Congressional Committee. Herbert was first mentioned in The Verdict, 1946. Edward Arnold played Congressman Arthur Malcolm. Arnold was born in 1890 in New York City. I'm walking here! Arnold began acting on the New York City stage. His first films were in 1916, and one of the titles was Vultures of Society, 1916. Arnold was a large man with a deep voice. His films continued until 1956 and include many classics and quite a number of film noirs. Highlights of these movies are Rasputin and the Empress, 1932, Duck Soup, 1933 with the Marx Brothers, Diamond Jim, 1935. The Glass Key, 1935. Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, 1939. Johnny Apollo, 1940. The Earl of Chicago, 1940. Design for Scandal, 1941. Johnny Eager, 1941. Meet John Doe, 1941. One of my favorites, The Devil and Daniel Webster, 1941. Kismet, 1944. Main Street After Dark, 1945. The Hucksters, 1947. The Mighty McGurk, 1947. Command Decision, 1948. Big Jack, 1949. Annie Get Your Gun, 1950. City That Never Sleeps, 1953. Miami Expose, 1956. And The Houston Story, 1956. Arnold died in 1956 at the age of 66. 
Cameron Mitchell played Lieutenant Ansel Goldberg. Mitchell was born in Pennsylvania in 1918. He came from a religious family and he remained such. In high school, he was scouted by professional baseball teams. Before World War II, he began working on Broadway and attended the Theater School of Dramatic Arts. When World War II broke out, he joined the U.S. Army Air Corps and served as a bombardier. Mitchell signed with MGM and made his film debut at age 26 in 1945. He continued on stage and was noted for the part of Happy in Death of a Salesman. He later played the same role in the movie version of Death of a Salesman 1951. He is best known for, as far as I'm concerned, How to Marry a Millionaire 1953, Recording the Voice of Jesus for the Robe 1953, Monkey on My Back 1957, Television Western The High Chaparral 1967 to 71, where he played Buck Cannon, dressed part biker, part gunfighter, and part riverboat gambler. Viva Knievel, 1977. The Swarm, 1978, one of the worst movies ever. My Favorite Year, 1982. And Terror in Beverly Hills, 1989. He was active into the 1990s and died in 1994. Ray Collins was cast in the important role of Major Desmond Lansing. Collins was born in 1889 in California. His family had been in California for a long time, and in fact, his great-grandfather was the commandant of Sutter's Fort before the gold strike. 1849, you know. Collins made his stage debut at the age of 14 in Vancouver, Canada. He worked for a time in vaudeville. In the 1930s, Collins began working on stage and as a radio actor. He also appeared in a number of film shorts. His radio work included working with Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater Group. Collins was on the famous War of the Worlds broadcast, but was uncredited. In his almost 90 films, Collins acted in some very important films. He played a lot of military officers and judges slash district attorneys. Since he worked with Welles, he was cast in the technically masterful Citizen Kane 1941. The next year, he was in another Welles film, The Magnificent Ambersons 1942. He was in a film I have not seen. Collins was a cardinal in the Hitler Gang, 1944, which showed Hitler's rise as a gangster story. He was in the film noir, Leave Her to Heaven, 1945. He played the stodgy old bank president, Mr. Milton, in The Best Years of Our Lives, 1946, which is one of the best films ever made. He had a small but important role in Command Decision, 1948. He was in the comedies, The Bachelor and the Bobby Soxer, 1947. Francis, 1950, About a Talking Army Mule, Kill the Umpire, 1950, The Reformer in the Redhead, 1950, and two Ma and Paul Kettle films, Ma and Paul Kettle Back on the Farm, 1951, and Ma and Paul Kettle on Vacation, 1953. Two other film noirs he acted in were The Racket, 1951, and The Desperate Hour, 1955, about an attempt on the president's life. His third Wells film was the masterful film noir Touch of Evil, 1958. However, Collins is best remembered as Police Lieutenant Tragg on television's Perry Mason, 1957 to 65. He often wore a fedora that was closer in size to a suit suit hat. Collins died in 1965. Story. Get me straight. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. The credits roll as a flight of B-17s cruise at high altitude, leaving contrails behind. Not a conspiracy. Actual World War II footage of bombs dropping and the explosions that they created were used. The scene switches to a Royal Air Force RAF briefing. They tell of the success of their night missions with only light losses. American Officer Major Davenport announces that the Americans have lost 48 bombers in the day's operation. The crowd is shocked. American war correspondent Elmer Brockhurst, Charles Bickford, and his partner James Carwood, John Ridgely, leave the briefing. The target of the American attack is not given. Carwood asks if any target in Germany is worth that many planes and crews. Key industrial objectives. <laughs> Fine comfort for a lot of new widows back home. What do you suppose is there, Brocky? Is there any one target in Germany worth 48 bombers? Worth it to whom? Brockhurst says the problem is Brigadier General Casey Dennis, Clark Gable. 
Brockhurst has a grudge against Casey for some reason. Brockhurst decides he will travel to the 32nd Bomb Group where Casey has his headquarters. When Brockhurst arrives at the airbase, there is a peaceful countryside disturbed only by the sound of airplanes taking off. Brockhurst sees the takeoff and realizes it is another maximum effort. His jeep driver confirms that they are throwing every plane they can get against the Nazis again. Casey stands like a man of steel on the control tower watching the planes leave, knowing many will not be coming back. Casey shows no emotion as he sees a damaged plane from the previous day's raid. Sitting at Casey's desk is Tech Sergeant Evans, Van Johnson. Evans jumps up when another man comes in. The man is bringing a model of a German ME-262 jet for the general. Casey comes in and goes right to work asking Evans questions about the previous day's strike. Casey requests to see Captain Jinx and is told that there is a war correspondent on the station. Casey goes to the plotting room to check on the strike. They get notification that the second target has been destroyed. Casey says two down and one to go. Major Belding Davis, John McIntyre, gives a weather report for Germany and is surprised that they will be hitting that deep again. What's your report on the boys' morale, Andy? After the last two days, they're too tired to bother about morale. How many crews are making their last mission today, George? Eleven, if they get back, sir. And we lose them anyway. Davis, any changes in your 1400 weather map? Well, sir, there's an interesting cold mass forming eccentrically over the Arctic Sea. Never mind the genealogy. How will it affect us tomorrow? Casey begins planning the strike with another maximum effort. Evans comes in with a message from Major General Roland Goodloe Kane, Walter Pigeon, saying that a congressional committee is coming and they must have low losses for the next three days. Finally, they release the name of the second target, Swinehoven, which translates roughly to Pig Haven. Brockhurst is prowling the halls and runs into Evans. Brockhurst tries to find out why Casey is losing so many planes and why he has Captain Jinx confined to quarters. Evans evades every question. Jinx comes in to see Casey. Jinx had refused to fly the Swinehoven mission. Jinx's uncle is the congressman that is coming to the base. Jinx's crew flew without him. Jinx then has a breakdown. Just then, General Kane comes in and brings Brockhurst in with him. Kane is happy to see Jinx, not knowing he is in trouble. Kane is shocked at the losses Casey has had. Brigadier General Clifton I. Garnet, Brian Dunleavy, is with General Kane as well. Garnet is a classmate of Casey and brother in law of Group Commander Colonel Ted Martin, John Hodiak, and everyone assumes. Casey's replacement. General Kane gets a call from a duchess, and it's clear that he is fighting the war in another way. Kane wants Casey and Brockhurst to make peace. Brockhurst tells Kane that there is another maximum effort, and the general is shocked. When he finds out the name of the target, Kane realizes that Casey has started Operation Stitch. Kane asks Brockhurst to leave the room. Kane arranges with his dog robber to keep the congressional committee away for a day. Kane issues a security blackout and says all flight orders must come from him. Casey says when Kane was away, the weather cleared and he ordered the operation to begin. Kane says it will cause appropriations to be cut back in Washington. Garnett asks to be brought up to speed on Operation Stitch. Casey shows him the model of the German jet and says a Czech engineer escaped the Nazis and landed one of the jets on their field. He shows the performance curve for the jet versus the Allies' best fighter and nothing can keep up with it. He then shows a film of the jet outclimbing and outperforming the Spitfire and the Mustang. Garnet and Kane are shocked at the performance of the jet. The operation name comes from A Stitch in Time Saves Nine. Kane is only interested in protecting daylight precision bombing. Their meeting is interrupted when the group starts coming in to land. All of the generals go outside to count planes. Eleven planes come back and they are not sure if it's the remains of twelve or thirty-six. It turns out to be 11 of 36, or 70% losses. The planes are coming in shot up with engines out. One is being flown by the bombardier as the pilot and co-pilot have been shot. Since the pilot is still alive, the bombardier wants to land the plane. Casey tries to talk him down. Casey gets him on the ground, but the bombardier uses his brakes and crashes the plane, which then explodes. Everyone is stunned by the close loss. The battered pilots from the other ship are brought back for the debriefing. 
Evans gets Kane out of the way with photographers so Martin can talk to Casey. Lieutenant Ansel Goldberg, Cameron Mitchell, is Martin's co-pilot and is not happy about the mission. Martin sadly reports that they hit the wrong target and that Swinehofen was untouched. Goldberg made the error, although Martin takes responsibility. When Kane and Garnett come in, Casey has to tell Kane that they hit the wrong target. Goldberg comes in with strike photos. Kane takes them and talks about what a fine job they have done. Casey is still trying to tell them the wrong target was hit. Finally, Goldberg says that they hit a torpedo factory by mistake. Kane wants to spin it as helping the Navy. It isn't Schweinhofen, sir. That's what I was trying to tell you. It isn't Schweinhofen. Not Schweinhofen? What is it then? It's the Nautilus Torpedo Factory at Gritzenheim, sir. Torpedo Factory? General, this is very opportune. Huh? Half the United Chiefs are admirals. Now, if we can get these to the allocation meeting... I'll send my own plane. You don't know what you've done for us, boy. Showing them that in the midst of the greatest air campaign in history, we still think enough of the larger aspect to knock out a torpedo factory, too. It wasn't two. It was instead. Casey takes responsibility, then Martin, and then Goldberg does. Goldberg feels sick about the losses. Kane will not allow them to give orders for the next day's attack. Casey tells him to prepare for Schweinhofen again. Brockhurst comes in, and he has found out that Schweinhofen did not get hit. Kane asks Brockhurst to write a story about inter-service cooperation. Martin says Operation Stitch, and Broadhurst says he is going to write the story correctly. Kane gives Brockhurst a top-secret file on Operation Stitch to read and forget. The group's intelligence officer is Major Desmond Lansing, Ray Collins. Lansing says the Nazis don't want to report the truth to their superiors. Lansing says that after they hit Schweinhofen, the Germans will know the third target and can send all of their fighters to defend it. Kane thinks he has the answer, asking Lansing if they should go forward with the operation. Lansing says they must go forward or the new German jets will end daylight precision bombing. Major, do you think the Germans will be able to put on as tough a show tomorrow as they did today? They will if we go into Germany itself, sir. But how can they? We've claimed over 180 enemy fighters destroyed in the last two days. Yes, I know we've claimed that, sir. Well, you don't believe our claim? Why, no, sir. Then why do you report them? Orders from your headquarters. Do you think the German high command knows what Stitch is all about? It's my personal opinion that they don't, sir. Why? The Germans don't like to give their superiors bad news, sir. But how can they help reporting what's happened? Their information has to go up through channels, too, sir. Uh, you evidently don't think their high command likes to face the truth. Well, my observation, sir, is that most professional soldiers think more about their political and mechanical problems than they do about the enemy. So when war comes, they have to ask amateurs like me what to do with their weapons. When the results are bad, they fire the amateurs and make the commanders field marshals. We don't have field marshals. I happen to be speaking about the Germans. Kane talks about the old days and lobbying with Billy Mitchell in the time between the world wars. Kane is more interested in the bigger plan to keep the Air Corps alive. Brockhurst says he thought the war was against the enemy and not the other services. Casey gets a call saying the weather will turn bad in two more days. Casey makes a case for what the Nazi Luftwaffe has done. He says what they are doing is checking the enemy. He says the jets will do for Germany what the Spitfire did for England during the Battle of Britain. Kane sends everyone out except Casey. Brockhurst says he will help. Kane says he will have to sacrifice Casey if Washington calls for it. Kane then releases command to Casey. Just then, the Congressional Committee shows up. Casey tries to order an attack on Schweinhofen, but Kane stops him. They wine and dine the committee. Congressman Arthur Malcolm, Edward Arnold, is loud and bolsterous. During a lull in the party, Garnett expresses to his brother in law his sister's concern about her husband flying so much. He is clearly marked for death. Garnett thinks he is getting a B-29 command in the Pacific. He wants his brother-in-law to be his chief of staff. Kane gets Casey alone and starts ragging him about what Malcolm is saying about appropriations. Casey tells that Malcolm's nephew, Jinx, is in trouble for refusing to fly. Casey forces Kane to accept the Swinehofen mission in exchange for not prosecuting Jinx. Kane releases the squadron to Casey, and he orders an attack on Schweinhofen. He also has Jinx released and orders him to report to the headquarters. Brockhurst hears Casey give the order and wonders how he did it. The orders go out over the wire, and the men go into action. Brockhurst begins writing a favorable story about the mission. They will travel 600 miles over enemy territory to spend four minutes on the target. In the morning, 
planes head for Schweinhofen. The Congressional Committee is very impressed with the air power. Colonel Martin is the lead plane of the attack. There's a beautiful montage of actual World War II plane footage. Jinx is with his uncle, Congressman Malcolm. Malcolm inadvertently jabs his nephew about being left behind. Casey gives a realistic picture of their chances. Word comes in from the states that Martin is a father. Kane's dog robber is giving Casey's speech to the Congressional Committee. Kane makes a case for more planes and aerial supremacy. Malcolm is being a jackass. He begins quizzing Casey about sending the bombers past the fighter protection limits and losing half of his strength. Casey says the appropriations made in 1938 are the reason the planes can't be protected. You explained a while ago that this was as far as your bomber planes could depend upon protection from our fighter planes. And I think you also said that for the third day in succession, your bombers have been deliberately sent far beyond this limit. That's correct. In other words, about half your plane strength and the lives of a thousand men have been lost within the last two days. And we still don't know about this afternoon. Has this been entirely your decision? It has. On nothing but your own authority? Yes. General Dennis was quite within his authority, Mr. Malcolm. But it seems to me our boys are paying a pretty bloody price for General Dennis's record. Arthur. They're paying a bloody price for the country's record. Oh, so the country is responsible for your sending them far beyond friendly fighter cover? Yes. Or more precisely, some of the country's elected representatives. May I ask how? How did you vote on appropriations for the Air Force in 1938? My golly, he's got you, Arthur. Kane takes Casey out before he hits Malcolm. Kane gives Casey a warning that he says is beyond friendship. Kane and Casey get ready to give Jinx a decoration. They get word from Martin that Swinehofen is destroyed. They give Jinx the medal. During the ceremony, Casey gets word that Martin and the rest of Jinx's crewmates have died. Captain Lucius M. Jinx, 32nd Bombardment Group Heavy. In action against the enemy, Captain Lucius Jinx has displayed heroic and meritorious conduct. Good luck, Casey. We are on fire and going. Going? Finish the message, can't you? That's all there is. Well, what's it mean? Who sent that? It's from my ship. You mean Colonel Martin? That same fine officer I shook hands with just this morning? Shut up. Do you mean to tell me he shut up? You're telling me to shut up when you're the one that's responsible? Will you shut up? Can't you understand that some guys have to do more than talk? When Malcolm realizes that Martin is dead, he starts in on Casey. Casey tells him to shut up. Finally, Jinx yells for his uncle to shut up. Jinx closes the case on the medals and storms out. Casey is upset and goes to work on the mission for the next day. Malcolm is advised to shut up. Casey looks at the map and hears the voices of the mission he ordered. Garnett comes in and tells Casey that General Kane is worried about him. He gets strike photos of Schweinhofen and has one more day of good weather. Casey is going to finish the job by hitting Findlehorst. Kane relieves Casey of command and places Garnett in charge. There are a lot of drunken soldiers on the base when the new commander comes on. One drunken soldier is Captain George Washington Bell Pepper Lee, Marshal Thompson. Garnett talks to his staff and finds out that a new commander means a milk run or an easy run. Garnett finds out that Kane doesn't normally pick the target. Evans says he is leaving. Garnett asks Evans about the easy mission. I've decided to go to Nevada to teach gunnery. You've decided. What do you think this army is? I'd rather not answer that, sir. Would it be too much to ask these boys for a tough one tomorrow? I don't know, sir. You must know from your own experience. Never had this experience, sir. Nobody in the Army ever asked me anything. They just told me. Garnett looks at the model of the ME-262. Captain Lee comes in and apologizes for being drunk. Garnett asks Lee about the missions he has been on. His next mission will be his 25th and last. Lee thinks he is going to get an easy run and then go home. Garnett realizes that Casey only sent these missions because he had to, not because he wanted to. Garnett asks Major Desmond Lansing if he would attack Findlehorst in the morning. He says he would because his son is training for the infantry. Casey comes in while Garnett is getting the weather briefing. Casey thinks he will get easy duty training pilots in the States. Oh, I guess I still rate a training command. 
I'd like to get one out west somewhere, where I could have Kathy and the kids with me. Get a day off now and then. Take the boy fishing. Garnett makes the decision to hit Findle Horse. Garnett says Casey had Martin to help him. Casey says surprisingly that he killed Martin so Garnett would not have to do it. When you first came over here, you had Ted to talk to. At least... Yes, I had Ted. That's one thing I've done for you, Cliff. I've killed Ted. You won't have to do that. Before Casey can get on his plane, he finds out that he is getting the B-29 command in the Pacific. He is not happy, but he decides to take Evans along with him. Change of orders for General Dennis, sir. Oh, no, you don't. From Washington, sir. I've got my orders. I've gone. Home. This is the biggest thing that could happen to any of us. It means a B-29 command. Brockhurst wishes him good luck. World famous short summary, all planes to Swinehofen. I hope you enjoyed today's show. I really appreciate you spending the time listening. You can find connections to social media and email on my site at classicmovierev.com. There are links in the podcast show notes as well. This is an independent show, and there is a lot you can do to help. First, and most importantly, jump over to Apple Podcasts and give me a review. It really helps the show get found. If you want to comment, help, or recommend a movie, email me. Beware the Moors.